Hey guys, uh, welcome to your Distance Learning Day assignment. Congratulations, you found it. All right, uh, as you just saw in the video, talking a little bit about classification today, how we take those groups of living things and break them into different groups. So let's talk about who first set up uh, our first recorded system of classification. You may already have guessed it from the video you just watched. Hey, it's Aristotle, who could have guessed? Yeah, it's that guy. Aristotle, who gave us lots of things in science, also gave us the first classification system. Now, Aristotle did give us sort of an unusual classification system. First, it only covered animals. No plants, no fungus. It certainly didn't cover bacteria, which Aristotle didn't even know existed yet. So he was looking at animals, and he said, I'm going to break everything into things that run, walk, things that swim, or things that fly. On the video, they said things that live on land, in water, or in air. Now, for some things, that's not a problem. We've got wolves, we've got fish, we've got eagles. We can pretty much decide where they go. But, if you look at it for any length of time, you'll figure out real quick that there's some animals that just aren't going to fit into those nice categories. Uh, and, what we know now is that some organisms that are maybe closely related don't necessarily all live in the same places, like, say, wolves and dolphins, or eagles and penguins. So, Aristotle gave us our first classification system, but we've moved past it. So, let's look at our next question. Why do we do this in the first place? Classification is important, and it's important to understand what it is and why we do it. The reality is, is classification makes things easier to study. It makes them easier to learn about, easier for scientists to know certain things already about them just by knowing where they fit in the classification scheme. I'm going to give you an example that you can see right now in your own house. Let's say all of a sudden I come knock at your door. Uh, and I want to borrow a spatula. I'm trying to make pancakes. I got no spatula in my house. So I come on in, take a look. Am I going to walk in the bathroom to look for your spatula? No, of course not. That'd be silly. I'm going to go to the kitchen. Okay, we already break things down in our houses. We classify them based on what we use them for. Things that we're going to use to cook with or eat with are going in the kitchen. Things we use for personal hygiene, probably in the bathroom. Things we use to get dressed and ready for the day, probably going to be in your bedroom. So we already break those things down. And in fact, we break them down to even smaller levels than that. Once we've broken things into, say, the rooms, we go ahead and break it down further. Going back to our spatula example, I do go in the kitchen. I'm looking for a spatula. Am I going to start opening the refrigerator or the freezer? No, that's where we keep food. Am I probably going to open the big cabinets underneath? No, that's usually where people keep things like pots and pans and Tupperware. Uh, I'm probably going to go ahead and look in one of the drawers. Probably have a drawer of cooking utensils, or maybe you have a special place on the counter where you keep those things. The point is, is that we already take things in our lives, we break them into large groups, then we break them into smaller groups, and smaller groups to make them easier to find. This also works with living things. So let me go ahead and translate this analogy for you just a little bit. Let me use this example for you. I've got three pictures here, three different animals. You've probably never seen these animals before. Uh, there are three animals here. One is called a hyrax. One's called a bird of paradise, and one's called a chimera. Now, I would imagine that you've already figured out which one the bird of paradise is, because you know what a bird is. You know that a bird is something that has feathers, uh, usually has a beak, uh, and a lot of times is going to go ahead and fly. And looking at those three animals, there's only one that comes close to that description. So you can go ahead and pick that out of the lineup. But if I ask you to guess which one's the chimera and which one's the hyrax, you might have a little bit more trouble with our last two. When we say something is a mammal, you know elephants are mammals, you know that dogs are mammals, that gorillas are mammals. A mammal is something that has hair or fur, is going to be warm-blooded, few other characteristics. By knowing what a mammal is, you can learn other things about new animals. For example, if I tell you that the hyrax on this page is a mammal, you've probably now figured out that it's the picture on the bottom. It's the guy down there with fur or hair not the fish in the upper corner. That, by the way, is the chimera, a distant relative of the sharks and the stingrays who lives in very deep water. So what you see here is by learning that these animals are related to something that you already know, a bird, a shark, and a mammal, you know a few things about them. And that's why classification is important. Next, we're going to go ahead and move on to a little bit more of our modern classification system. Now we're getting away from Aristotle. Let's figure out how we got to where we are today. Hey, it's that other guy. Wait, you probably have never heard of this guy. Uh, this is a man. He was a scientist. He was Norwegian. His name was 
originally was Carol Linné. However, uh, Carol Linné loved science so much, and at that time, Latin was the huge language of science. Scientists did things in Latin. And he loved Latin so much that he actually changed his name to Carolus Linnaeus. He l made his name more Latin sounding. So sort of an interesting character, but Carolus Linnaeus gave us most of the parts of our modern classification system. Really two big things. One, he gave us the groups that we break things down into. Okay, we go ahead and we break all living things into one of six kingdoms. And you're going to learn more about those kingdoms in a little while. One of them, for instance, is the animal kingdom. We then break the animal kingdom into what are called phyla. That's a plural. The individual is phylum. There are 26 different phyla in the animal kingdom. One of those phyla, include, one of those phyla includes the... Uh, sorry, excuse me, um, jellyfish, sea anemones, their cousins. Uh, one includes the insects and all of their relatives, and one includes all of the vertebrates. So we break those kingdoms down into phyla. Now those phyla get further broken down. The vertebrates, for instance, are broken into the next group of fish, amphibians, reptiles, things like that. So we keep breaking them down, breaking them down, just like in your kitchen, you have all of your kitchen utensils in the kitchen, but you break them down to silverware in one drawer, cooking utensils in another drawer, pots and pans in a different cabinet. We break those things down even further. Okay, Linnaeus is really who gave us that. We're going to talk about this more uh, in the coming week. Right now, there's just a phrase I want you to remember. King Philip came over for good soup. That's what I want you to remember. King Philip came over for good soup. We're going to come back to that a little bit later. But right now, just worry about Linnaeus helped us discover those different, helped us discover how to break things down into kingdoms and go down from there. All right, let's talk about what else Carolus Linnaeus gave us. Linnaeus also gave us our naming system. How do we name plants and animals and other living things? The first answer is we give them a true scientific name. Uh, the scientific name will be in Latin, and we will give them two names, a genus name and a species name. The genus name tells us a little bit about who they're related to, kind of like your last name. The species name is specific to that organism. Okay, the picture I've got here is uh, an animal that you guys are all probably familiar with. It's our beloved school mascot, the cougar. Now the problem, a lot of times people say, well, why do we need a scientific name? Why don't we just give everything, why don't we just call it by what everybody calls it? The problem is that not everybody calls it the same thing. Okay, depending on where you are in the U.S. and who you're talking to, this is either a cougar, a mountain lion, a panther, a Florida panther, or even a puma. Okay, and that's just in English. You go to other countries, they're going to have the same problem. So we've got to find a way to agree. We also can see the opposite problem. One of the things I love to do is go deep sea fishing for red snapper in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a good tasting fish. I, however, have also been to the Pacific Ocean. They have another ant fish there called the red snapper. Same exact name, two completely different fish. So what helps is if we can go ahead and give things a scientific name to make sure that when you're uh, talking to people from other countries or different regions, that you can make sure scientifically you're talking about the same organism. So even though this animal right here is known as cougar, puma, panther, mountain lion, in science he's known as Felis concolor. And that's his name, and that's no matter where you go, we have only one species of big cat really here in the U.S., and it's this guy right here. So, Carolus Linnaeus gave us that. He gave us that two-name naming system. So, what's new in the world of classification? What do we use that Linnaeus didn't have? Well, Linnaeus used a system that was good, and we've kept a lot of parts of it, but he didn't totally understand how living things are interconnected. What we look at now is actually how closely related are uh, living things. Uh, what is their evolutionary history? How long ago were they uh, looking at a similar species in their past? So what we do now is look at physical structure, uh, internal physiology, looking at the bones and the layout of how the animal's body works or the plant's body structure works, uh, the development of the embryo in certain cases, and when all else fails, we can always test DNA to look at and figure out how closely are things related. So even though a wolf and a dolphin look very different and live in different places, we go ahead and put them both in the group of mammals because they are more closely related. In a little while here, you're going to go ahead and check out the six kingdoms, and you're also after that going to get a chance to see how those classifications work, and you'll in fact get to see and look at, say, the bone structures in the forearm of a wolf and a dolphin and a shark, and compare those and see who's more closely related.
So just now, though, you're going to take a look at the six kingdoms of life. So let's take a look uh, here on this next slide. All right, here's a quick picture of the six kingdoms. You're going to go learn a lot more about these. Some of them you're already familiar with, the plants and the animals. Okay, again, these are their Latin names. Some you're less familiar with. There are two different kingdoms for bacteria. Most of you guys are familiar with fungi. And then we have the good old protists, which you'll learn more about in a second. What I'd like you to do is close this here when I finish talking and go to that Six Kingdoms page that's linked on Edmodo. And uh, take a look. Learn all about it. Maybe take some notes. And there's going to be an Edmodo post that says, what do you know about the Six Kingdoms? Every student needs to post one new thing that you know. And I say new, I mean it can't already have been posted. So if you get in there early, it's going to be nice and easy for you. If you get in there a little bit later, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. So only post one thing, one new thing for everybody. That's part of your grade today. All right, guys, I will see you in a little while when you're done with the next steps.